Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of many, available by free download or podcast. The hundreds of hours of lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an online chat, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate or tune into our continuous web broadcast, visit our website for more information at GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. For more information or to make a donation, visit our website at GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. path of balance is defined as a path of psychological equilibrium. This word psychological is utilized a lot uh, nowadays but it seems that the original meaning of the term has been somewhat lost. It comes from the root Greek, psyche. The word psyche in Greek refers to the soul. We tend to think of psychology nowadays as being mental, related to the mind. But in fact, real psychology is related with the soul, with our very essence. So psychology also has this word in it, logos. Psyche, logos. Logos means word. Or it has a deeper connotation than just a word. It refers to divinity, to the root expression of the absolute. Logos has a meaning somewhat like if in your mind you have a concept and then you express it through your mouth, that expression of the concept is logos. That's the meaning of it. It doesn't mean just a word. It's an expression of something that's abstract. So, Psyche Logos, these two words refer to two parts of our structure, two parts of our inner constitution. The Psyche is our very soul, it is our essence. It is the true nature of our being. The psyche in Greek mythology is a young maiden who's innocent. And she represents the fundamental nature of our self. It is a kind of innocence and a kind of primordial happiness, but that becomes entranced.
And the Logos represents the divinity that Psyche comes from. If we study the Kabbalah, we know that the Logos is the top triangle on the Tree of Life. We always talk about the three Logos. The first Logos is Keter. The second Logos is Chokmah. And the third Logos is Bina. In Christian terms, these are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Hindu terms, they are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. It is the primordial trinity, the law of three, the law that creates. The Logos is the expression of the abstract, absolute space. The Logos is the word. If you've, read, if you've studied Christianity, you've heard this famous first three lines of the book of John. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning refers to the absolute. The word is the expression of that. So then we see in us this relationship between psyche and logos. Or rather, the longing to restore that relationship. A relationship that most of us have forgotten. That most of us have no real experience with. A taste of that. Or even less, the daily experience of it. Real psychology is about reuniting psyche and logos. The reunion. And in Sanskrit, that reunion is called yoga. It means to unite, to bond. But the real meaning of that Sanskrit word is to unite oneself with a truth. That truth is the logos, the word. It's the same as the word religion, religare to unite, to bind. So in the Gnostic tradition, we study psychology a lot. In order to understand our soul, to work with our soul, to develop our soul, so that psyche can become a fully developed soul. That is our psyche, our soul, our true nature. So, in order to understand this union a little better, we have a graphic that we can study today. And uh, if you're listening to the lecture, there is the graphic on the website. And if you're coming into the class today, we have a book flyer you can refer to. This illustration represents the fundamental terminology and their interrelationships. These terms are very specific. And they refer to aspects of ourselves that we need to get to know very well in order for us to really have yoga or religion or a union with our divine source. These terms are not vague. They aren't open to interpretation. They're scientific. They have precise meaning, precise definition. And in order for us to experience gnosis, real knowledge, in order for us to taste and unite with our own divine root, we have to know scientifically through our experience in ourselves what these terms are. Not as a concept, but as a practical working reality. So this graphic, this chart, hopefully will help illustrate and organize these concepts for you so that you can work with them practically in your daily experience. Fundamentally, we look at the right-hand side related to the interior worlds. If we have an interest in religion, an interest in spirituality or mysticism. It's generally a longing to know the truth beyond the senses, the physical senses. 
we generally want to know what is God? What happens after we die? Why are we alive? Why are we here? These kind of questions are really important, but can't be answered with our physical senses. We have a lot of theories about them. We have a lot of beliefs. We have many traditions. We have many dogmas. But to answer those questions, we have to have experience of the truth. Those experiences, or that type of experience, cannot be found in the exterior world. It can only be found in the interior worlds. And that's why all the religions throughout time have always said to look within. Jesus emphasized this. Buddha emphasized this. Krishna. All of the great teachers always emphasized to look within for the answers. And in the West, perhaps one of the most famous pieces of advice ever given was at the Delphic Oracle, who said, in essence, if you want to know the mysteries of nature, if you want to find the truth, look within yourself. The quote basically says, Man, know thyself, and thou shalt know the universe and its gods. This isn't just clever philosophy. It's a fact. It's a scientific truth that unfortunately our modern science has forgotten. Even though nowadays some of those on the vanguard of modern science have begun to grasp that essential truth as they've been seeing the profound relationship between smallest particles of existence and our consciousness. They've seen that our consciousness reflects the existence outside of it or around it. That there is some kind of relationship that scientists can't fully grasp. But that mystics have known for centuries, for millennia. The Orphic, or the Delphic Oracle, said, Know thyself to know the universe and its gods. And what's interesting about this Delphic Oracle is that tradition states that the oracle at Delphi, in order to make prophecies, in order to answer questions, would sit on a chair with three legs over a fissure or a gap, a chasm in the earth. And from that chasm would emerge vapors that inspired an ecstasy. And in that ecstatic state, the oracle would make profound statements, prophecies, and give insight into problems. This uh, description is deeply symbolic and points for us towards what we need to answer our most profound questions. All of us who are interested in religion and spirituality have a longing to answer not only the philosophical questions of why am I here, but also questions such as, what am I supposed to do? What's going to happen to me? What is my future? What is my past? Who am I? You see, the oracle gave its secret. The famous oracle of Delphi, who was known throughout the world, gave the very secret of the ability to penetrate into the truths of nature, the truths of oneself, and that is to know oneself. So scholars and mystics have always interpreted the stories of the Delphic Oracle as being literal, that literally these women, virgins by the way, would sit on a three-legged chair over a literal uh, chasm, a split in the earth, and literally gases would come up 
and give them an ecstasy. And so nowadays, there are a lot of people searching in caves for gases coming out of the earth to try to replicate this ecstatic state. They don't get it, that the story is symbolic. The oracle says, man, know thyself. What is thyself? What is the earth? What is the split in the earth? What is that chair with three legs? All of that represents psyche. They're symbols. In previous lectures, we've been talking a lot about the three brains. Those are the three legs of the chair. When you sit on a chair properly, you have balance, right? Otherwise, you'll fall off. The oracle is sitting in psychological equilibrium over her three brains in balance. Makes sense, right? When you've studied a little bit of Gnostic psychology, this becomes self-evident. The earth is the body. We've also explained in many lectures that in religious symbolism, earth represents the body. Malkut on the tree of life. And those fumes that steam, those gases that come out of the earth, relates to transmutation. It relates to the transformation of energies to the rising of purified forces coming from the earth towards heaven. It is the smoke of prayer, the smoke of incense, the steam, the purified element escaping out of the earth to rise upwards. That is transmutation. That is alchemy. So when any of us places our psyche in psycholo psychological equilibrium, seated upon our throne, which is the pineal gland, and we have our three brains in equilibrium, in balance, at rest, and we have our earth stable under us, our body, with the energies transformed in a healthy way, then the ecstasy emerges. Psyche becomes enlivened, awakened, inspired. Psyche is our soul. This is how we can receive prophetic guidance from God. So when we look at our diagram, we see in the center on the right-hand side of the tree of life, in the very center we see Malkut. Malkut is our body. It is physicality. And Malkut sits between the superior worlds and the inferior worlds. These are internal, interior, psychological, spiritual. To the left of this diagram of the Tree of Life, we see a map of the human machine. We see our seven centers which can be simplified as three brains. Our intellectual center, or our intellectual brain, which is where thoughts process. Intellectual concepts, theory, ideas. And then we have our emotional brain, or emotional center, which is where we have our sentiments, our feelings. All of those little more subtle sensations related with emotion. And then the third brain, motor, instinctual, sexual. The third brain is those three centers. And these relate, of course, to our nervous systems and to the <coughs> management of the physical body, energetic and physiological forces. These three brains 
transform energy. That's all they do. They only transform energy in accordance with how they are managed. <coughs> they have no cognizance of their own. They only do what they're told. They're like machines, robots in some way, you could say. The intellect receives energy and processes it according to the forces directing it. And the same is true of our emotional center, and the same is true of our motor center, and our instinctual center, and our sexual center. Thus, we have what we call a human machine. This is our physical body that is controlled and managed by other forces, many of which are out of our control, consciously speaking. That is, psyche doesn't control the machine, does it? We think that we're in charge of our life and our body. We believe that we're in charge of our life and our body. But see, thinking and believing are two of our three brains. Nonetheless, if we look at the facts, we really don't do anything. Everything just happens to us. Observe your life. Study what happens to you. Study what you actually do through your conscious will. And observe what a small percentage of your life is a reflection of your conscious will. As an example, most of us, we could say, sleep physically 50 or 60% of our lifetime. Right? Physic our physical body, we put it to bed 8 to 10 hours a day, maybe a little more. And then we have times when we're sick or when we're children, when we sleep more or we're older. So we can say there's some percentage, 40 to 60%, where we sleep most of our life. What about the rest? Most of the rest of the time, the majority of it, we spend worrying about what we're going to eat, and then we're eating. And then we spend a lot of time dealing with things that are completely out of our control that we're merely reacting to. And that's the rest of our life, pretty much. Most of what we're doing now, we're just reacting to. We have big bills coming in, we get sick, we have an illness, our family member is sick or ill. We have problems at work, problems at home, problems with family, problems with neighbors, problems on many levels that we can't control. We just react. Observe that in your life and then think seriously about how much of your life is actually under your conscious will. How much has it been your will to make it happen? And we'll see, if we're sincere, it's very small percent, a fraction of our total life is actually our will, what we want. And this is because of the forces that are acting through our three brains from our submerged mind. We tend to think that our life situation, our problems, all come from outside. We tend to think and believe that it is the exterior world that defines who we are and what we are and what we experience. And this is why in our illustration, the human figure is directing itself into the exterior world with its back to the interior world. How much do we know of our interior world? We all long to know it. That interior world that is the domain of psyche, the domain of Persephone, 
the heavens and the hells. We have a lot of theories, a lot of ideas, but how many of us have experienced heaven? Consciously. How many of us have experienced hell? Consciously. Probably a very small minority. It shouldn't be like that. If we're really following religion, the statement is, man, know thyself, and you will know the universe and its gods. And this is because our interior world is a reflection of the universe. If we want to know heaven, we have to get there through that heaven that is inside of us. If we want to see if hell is real, all we have to do is look into our mind, and we will see it. You see, heaven and hell are within. They are states of consciousness, states of being. This is why the great master Padmasambhava said, heaven or samsara and nirvana are inside, not outside. They are states of consciousness, states of being. How would we define our life? Heaven or hell? What is our experience of life? Well, let's look at this graphic to see if we can define that. The heavenly realms, the superior worlds, would be related to states of consciousness that are very elevated. We might call them virtues. In Buddhist terms, they would be called paramitas, which are conscious attitudes, perfections. These would be states such as sincere generosity, authentic chastity, conscious love, true altruism, Selfless giving. Sincere happiness for the well-being of others. How often do we experience those states of consciousness in ourselves? We have to be honest. How often do we truly feel in our heart, in our mind, in our body, selfless love? The ability to give to someone, to sacrifice for someone, without any thought of I, me, myself. That type of experience, which does happen for us, is rare. It happens for us when our consciousness is unconditioned. When it is not modified by a desire. But of course, for us, most of the time, our consciousness is modified by desire. So even if we feel the longing to help someone else, to be generous, let's say, to give to someone who's in need, we may do it. But in our mind is this, I did a good thing. That I is pride. That I is not divine. Even when we see our close friend get something really important to them that they need, that they really need, and we feel that happiness for them, at the same time, we may feel envious. I wish I had that. I wish I had that success, got that promotion, got that person as a spouse or a friend. So even when we feel that bit of happiness for the other person, there's envy there. That isn't heaven. That isn't nirvana. 
Through this type of analysis of ourselves, we start to see the difference between a liberated and a conditioned consciousness. This is the difference between heaven and hell. Stated quite simply, we go according to what we are. We are where we are because of what we are. We're not in heaven because our mind is not heavenly. We're in hell. Sorry if you didn't realize it before. But the simple fact is, by analysis of the psychological state of humanity, we can see that this planet has become hell. We have to discard this idea that hell is some other place, that it is vague, that it is some other dimension. No. Hell is our mind. This is why the Greek myth explains how Persephone's psyche becomes trapped in hell, in the domain of Pluto. How Eurydice is brought into hell. How Helen is captured by the Trojans. All of these stories represent the same essential truth. Our psyche is trapped by desire. That desire produces suffering. Thus we suffer. This is the basic, most fundamental teaching of Buddhism. The Four Noble Truths. The first says there is suffering. The second says suffering is caused by desire. What is the fundamental heart of desire? I. Me. Myself. The very concept of a myself. That is the cause of desire. And that concept of the myself is essentially false. It is an illusion. It isn't real. We do have an identity. We have a self. But that self is not desire. The consciousness, when it's free, is pure happiness. Divine. Beautiful. And that's why in all the traditions, the free, pure consciousness is represented as a beautiful, innocent, virginal maiden. Persephone, her other name is Kore, which means maiden or virgin. In Buddhism, that virginal maiden, the free consciousness, is called Buddha Datu, the essence or seed of the Buddha. It's called Biridice, it's called Helen, it's called Beatrice in other traditions. It is the Buddha nature. It is a very pure, very beautiful reflection of divinity. And it emerges out of the superior worlds, specifically through the Sephirot of Tiferet, which is related with the human soul. In Hebrew, Tiferet means beauty. Tiferet is beautiful. In the beginning, Medusa was beautiful. But because of vanity and pride, she became horrible. She became the antithesis of Athena, the virgin divine mother. And these are the two polarities of consciousness that we see. The Medusa represents the conditioned consciousness. The ego, with its many snakes on its head. You know Athena's symbol? is a serpent. You may have seen statues of her with serpents around her neck, maybe a serpent under her hand that she controls. Her antithesis is Medusa, who is many serpents, not one. And that's a reflection of how our consciousness becomes conditioned through our many desires, through our many wills, our many longings, our many mistakes. We have this illusion that our self is one. 
that we are one person, an individual. But there is no evidence to support this. If you learn to apply dialectics to yourself, you can demonstrate this, even just through logic. But through experience, it's even easier. From moment to moment, from day to day, we contradict ourselves. Today, we love our spouse. We would do anything for our spouse. But it only takes one word, one glance, one bit of peanut butter left on the counter for us to hate our spouse. Right? We love our child. We would do anything for our child. We would die for them. But one vomit. <laughs> right? One bad grade, and we want to kill them. These are rather silly examples. What about our job? What about our friends? What about our interests? What about from moment to moment? What about diets? Today we say, I'm going to lose 10 pounds, and I'm going to eat this, and I'm going to exercise, and I'm going to do this and that. And we may do it for a couple of days. If we have a lot of willpower, we might do it for a couple of weeks. But soon enough, we've got those boxes of Twinkies in the fridge again, or in the counter. We're eating pizza again. We're sitting on the TV, and the stomach's getting bigger and bigger. Where is our will? We say, I'm going to do charity for humanity. I'm going to sacrifice my time and go feed the homeless. So we go once. We have a great time. We love the homeless people. And we go a second time. And then we start to get irritated. And then we go a third, and then that's it. And we have all kinds of reasons. Oh, they don't appreciate me over there. Oh, they're too disorganized. Oh, it's too far. I don't have time anymore. Where is our will? Where is our consistency? Why do we contradict ourselves? You see, our psyche is asleep, entranced in the mirror of self-love, in the mirror of desire, in the mirror of pleasure. And our will has become conditioned. On one day, we make a proclamation, and the next day we contradict it. This is because, from one moment to the next, we don't have conscious control over our three brains. Our psyche is asleep, not awake. Our psyche is not sitting on the tripod of the oracle. The tripod is being utilized by all those different elements in our mind. And they fight with each other to control it. This is why from one moment to the next, if we really start to watch ourselves, we will see that constant stream of thinking and feeling that's surging in us from moment to moment changes, contradicts itself. In one moment, we want to eat. And then a few moments later, we remember we're going to be on a diet. So we say, no, I'm not going to eat. But then, we see an ad with a beautiful cake. And that desire builds in our body until suddenly we're in the grocery store and we're buying the cake and we think, oh, just this one time. Right? Or we see that beautiful person and we think, I really want to be like them. I want to be skinny and healthy and beautiful and dress well. Then we go to the store. We start to buy all the expensive clothes. Then we feel guilty. We say, no, I'm not going to buy anything. Then we leave. Then we go home. All we can think about is those clothes. Then we go back. You see, there's this swing. And it's very confusing and very inconsistent. And it's different for every one of us. An angel, a Buddha, a master, does not have that. We do because we're abnormal. 
we have a psychological illness, rather a disease. That disease is called ego, desire. And we call this the doctrine of the many eyes, the many egos. Watch yourself. Know thyself. And watch this stream of contradictory urges and desires. Get to know that. And every one of us, it's different. My examples may not apply to you. Find your own experience of how from moment to moment a desire emerges in you and it works through your motor brain, it works through your instinctual brain, your center rather, sexual center, or it moves you through your heart, or it moves you through your thoughts. And know this. Every one of those eyes uses all of your centers to fulfill its will. Every eye has three brains. Every ego. When you become angry, look at the state of consciousness that you experience and compare that with the state of consciousness you had before the anger came. And look at the difference. When you feel lustful, look at the state of consciousness of that lust and how it works in your three brains. That element, that conditioned consciousness, pushes you to fulfill the lust through thoughts, through emotions, and through impulses in the body. When that anger takes control of your human machine, all you want to think about is revenge. All you want to think about is how you were wronged, how you were betrayed, how you didn't deserve it. All you feel is resentment. All you feel is pain. And your body wants to act, either to run away or to attack. This is anger controlling the human machine. Anger is from hell. There is no anger in nirvana. There is no lust in nirvana. There is no envy in heaven. When envy takes charge of the human machine, our thoughts persist. I deserve that. I want that. I want what she has. I need what he has. How can I get it? And so the mind plots, it thinks, it diagrams, it figures it out, it makes plans, it makes projects to get what it wants. And in your heart is the longing for that, the burning for that, a pain, an emptiness that you feel can only be filled by that thing that you've got to get. If you're a child, it's bubblegum. Or it's a new game. Or it's shoes like, like Cynthia has. You've got to have those shoes because Cynthia's got them. All my friends have it. I need it too. Envy. And it burns. It hurts. It's painful. And then in the body, motor, instinctual, sexual, is that discomfort, that continual feeling that you cannot relax until you get it. And you've got to act. You've got to go out. You've got to steal money from your mom's purse. You've got to do something to get the shoes or whatever it is. For adults, something else. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's position. Maybe it's respect. Then we see an ad on TV or our friend calls and says, oh, I just got a new car. It's so cool. And then we have a new envy. I got to get a new car. Right? These are extreme examples that this same function is happening in us constantly with things that we don't even see. 
smaller elements that we don't even notice. Things like just getting attention from other people. We want respect. We want love. We want to be admired. We want to be valued. Sometimes we want to be feared. Many of us want to be lusted after. All of this belongs to hell. None of it belongs to nirvana or heaven. So in this surging sea of desires, of eyes that take control of our human machine, who's in charge of our house psychologically? Who's in charge of our inner temple? Where is God? If our minds are so filled with continual thoughts of I, me, myself, what I want, what I deserve, what I need, what I am owed, how can God fit into that space? How can our innermost guide us if all we think of is me and myself? There's no room. So what we find then, by observing ourselves, is that this conditioned consciousness is in continual control of our human machine. And that little percentage of free consciousness that remains for us, which is about 3%, sleeps. We don't use it. We're too busy avoiding our fears avoiding our pains, and trying to satisfy all of our many desires. Chasing men, chasing women, chasing money, chasing position, chasing status, trying to get respect, trying to get others to envy us, trying to satisfy our lust, trying to avoid the truth, always looking for comfort and security in outside things. You see, this situation rotates around a profound lack in our heart, a profound missing something, a longing. Some of us feel it like a black pit in our heart that we can't even bear to see, but that when we feel it, threatens to consume us with its pain and emptiness. This is a great black hole, you could say. And most of our lives we spend trying to cover that up, to fill it with something, so we will no longer feel that emptiness in our heart, so that we won't feel anymore disconnected, purposeless, alone. You see, we transform, we think that that emptiness in our heart is loneliness. We think it is a lack of fulfillment. We think it is a lack of purpose. We think it is a lack of money, a lack of emotional connection. And so we go out into the outside world, this exterior phenomenon, seeking things to fill that space in our heart that pains us so much. And no matter what we do, we can never fill it. We go from job to job, from boyfriend to boyfriend, from city to city, and still that longing, that emptiness, that something that is missing in our heart is never satisfied. This is why we see people turning to drugs, turning to alcohol, turning to sex addiction, turning to fanaticism, becoming great fanatics or skeptics because they can't deal with that emptiness in the heart. They want to become numb. People kill themselves 
They submerge themselves into the depths of addiction and violence to run away from that emptiness in the heart. All of that is mistaken. That emptiness in the heart is there because we don't allow God into it. Not some God upon a throne, but our Logos, our innermost, our being, our inner Buddha. You see, we fill that space with so much stuff, mistaken concepts, mistaken ideas about ourselves, about the world, about satisfaction. We don't realize that that space is there in order for us to perform the yoga, the religion, the union with God. You see, there's a great mystical statement that says, God searches the nothingness in order to fill it. We have covered that nothingness with desires for pleasure, sensation, money, status, self-esteem. We have to break that shell, the cage. We have to accept that emptiness and allow our divinity to fill it. That takes a lot of courage. To do that means you have to go against yourself, against your habits, against your comforts, against your securities. You have to die as a mind. You have to die as an ego. You have to die as a false self in order that that real being can emerge. We have to imitate this oracle. The secret of the oracle is cognizance of oneself. Know thyself. If there's something in ourselves we're avoiding, then we don't know it. That is, we are willfully ignorant. We prefer ignorance and to chase desire. We've never understood what even the, the oldest written document in human history states. The laws of Manu from India says this, desire can never be satisfied. Just in the same way that a fire will never go out, the more you give it fuel. That fire that burns in us is passion, it is pride, it is envy, it is fear, it is resentment, it is gluttony, it is laziness, it is avarice. It is all those elements that we live with on a daily basis that we think is me. But that is not. It is a conditioning that we've created over millennia. But that is all false. It is a conditioning that we've created in order to avoid the truth of ourselves, in order to hide from our mistakes, in order to justify ourselves, in order to blame others. We love to blame others. We love to blame God. There are many people in many religions who love to blame other religions. There are many people in different countries who love to blame other countries. Very rare is it to find someone who realizes and recognizes that all of the blame is their own. We are exactly what we have made ourselves into. That is the nature of karma, cause and effect. What you are is what you have done. What you will be will be according to what you do. If you want an unconditioned consciousness, liberated, free, that naturally radiates happiness and serenity and contentment, you have to create the causes that produce that. And the cause is quite simple. Kill the conditioning. Destroy the cage. Tear apart the house. What do you have to fear? If we persist as we are, we will remain as we are or get worse. 
There's no evidence anywhere that being as we are will bring improvement in our lives. In fact, we see the opposite. We see humanity becoming worse. The problem here is that we become confused by an element that's become very powerful, so much so that we don't even see it anymore. And that is personality. So on our chart, this is the element on the far left. Personality comes from the root persona, which means mask. We've explained in other lectures that in each lifetime, when our essence descends into a physical body and takes birth, we create a new physical body, right? Nature gives us a new body. At the same time, the consciousness that's in that body begins to create a personality, a persona. That personality is born in that time, is grown and developed according to the circumstances of that time. That is, all of us have personalities that belong to these moments in history. If we had the personality of someone who lived in the Mayan culture, we wouldn't fit in at all. If we had the personality of someone who lived in the Egyptian times or in ancient India, we would not fit in. Everything about us would be different. Our tastes in food, clothes, the way we speak, what's important to us, the things that we value would all be different. Personality belongs to time. It is born when we are born into this body and it dies when we die. Well, it begins to die when we die. It's purely an energetic force. It is a weaving, you could say, of psychological forces but it doesn't really exist beyond that. From birth, throughout our lifetime, we grow and develop a personality. and We're always modifying and changing it. That personality is simply a face that we wear. It is the face of our family situation, the culture we've come from, the language we've spoken, the religion that we inherited, the cultural values that we inherited, modes of behavior, tastes in food and clothes and, and action, all of that is personality. The problem now, not only do we have this surging chaos that is subconscious and unconscious and infraconscious in us, but now we have this personality that we think is us. Many of us confuse all of these pieces. A common person without any education in religion or mysticism thinks that the personality is their identity. Right? Most people we encounter think, I am Cynthia. And I am Latino or Latina, right? And I am from this country and this race, and I belong to this religion, I am these things. This is all wrong. It's all wrong. The consciousness is immortal. The psyche that we have is born and dies, and born and dies, and born and dies. Again, and again, and again, and again. Because the consciousness, psyche, is energy that can never be destroyed. You realize that? Your true nature never dies. It changes. It's like a butterfly that emerges and goes back into a cocoon, and then emerges and goes back into a cocoon, again and again and again. The problem is, because the consciousness in us is asleep, we have no memory of it. And all of us demand proof of this. Well, if this is true, how come I can't remember my past lives? How come I can't remember when I was born in all these other ages and times? Well, the answer is obvious. You can't even remember what happened to you yesterday. Right? You can't even remember what happened to you last week. 
What were you doing 10 days ago at this moment? But furthermore, the process of death and the process of birth are very powerful transformative experiences. It takes a huge amount of energy. And when the consciousness passes through that transformation, it's like a big shock. Has anyone here ever been knocked unconscious or had a concussion or had a strong blow to the head and had a loss of memory? Has anyone here woken up in the morning and not known where they are or who they are and had that strong shock of, where am I? That experience pales in comparison to the strength of the transformation of birth and the strength of the transformation of death. There are states of consciousness that we pass through that are like a strong electric shock on the consciousness. And because we are asleep, and because we're not trained to pass through it consciously, we pass through it with a great shock. And when we come out the other side, we're in a new body. We're in a new family. We're in a new country. We're in a new time. Now, as babies, we might remember some of that from the past. But as we grow up, and as our personality gets strong, and as our parents are telling us, no, 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 that's all in your head. That's all imaginary. That doesn't exist. You're here with us now. You belong to us. We forget. All the memories are lost. They're still there in the consciousness, deep within us. And we can retrieve them. But unfortunately, we tend to love our personality very much. We believe it is ourselves. And so we never feel the impulse to go beyond that personality and to see our true nature. <coughs> so here is our fundamental situation. In a simple diagram trying to illustrate something that's very complicated. We are here in this physical world believing we are the personality. Believing that this body is the only body we have and that this body is our true self and that it reflects our true nature. And that's why we spend so much time dressing it up and trying to make it look pretty. Trying to make others like us through our physical body. We forget that the physical body is like a suit of clothing. And we've changed it many times. The body wears out and we take a new one. This is how asleep we are. We have no consciousness of any of this. And in the meantime, the physical world is bombarding us with impressions. We take in all of this information from the physical world the exterior worlds, through our senses. And our personality transforms them according to its nature. This is a very important point. You see, we also mistakenly think that we see life for what it is. We don't. We don't see anything of life. The Buddha Shakyamuni said very beautifully, if we could see a single flower clearly for one moment, our life would be forever changed. It's a very powerful statement by one of the greatest masters that's ever walked the earth. And we think, oh, I can see the flower. We don't. We don't see anything except the projections of our mind. That's all we see, the projections of our mind. We live in an illusion that is self-created and self-perpetuated. And all of these pieces are part of that cage. We need to get to know them very well. That's how we can break the cage. The Buddha also said, if you want to untie a knot, you first have to know how it was tied. That knot is our psyche, which is trapped inside of a cage. We have to get to know that, to transform it, to undo it. 
So the physical world is always providing us with this great barrage of data. And our personality takes this and transforms it. Right here is where we have to start. Starting to see how we take in impressions. Self-observation provides the foundation for this. Self-observation is a very specific term that refers to awakening our consciousness to make ourselves awake from moment to moment, to be present, to be aware of being here and now. This isn't just to do this every once in a while. It's not to just say, oh yeah, okay, I'm here now. And then we go off into dreamland again, daydreaming, fantasizing. That isn't it. It's to be continually mindful and aware of ourselves. Continually. Not merely all day long, but all night. You might think I'm crazy. But this is the very basis of real religion. A continual remembrance of oneself. Self-observation and self-remembering are what we call them in Gnosis. Self-observation is to be continually watchful of the three brains. To be watching. To be watching our thoughts. To be watching our feelings. And to be watching the impulses that arise in us. I didn't say to change them. I didn't say to suppress them. I said, watch them. This is a continual, ongoing effort. It does not happen mechanically. It can never happen automatically. In other words, if you're on autopilot, you're asleep. Become aware of that. When you wake up in the morning, what do you start with? You start immediately with, I have so many things to do today. I've got to get started. And we start immediately with all of our habits. We brush our teeth the same way. We put our pants on this leg than that leg. We eat the same things. But worse is we're thinking the same things. Feeling the same things. Driven. Without cognizance. Initiate your day with conscious awareness of yourself. Pray. Remember God. Meditate. That makes the first note of the day. And it can change your day. And then throughout the day, continually watch what's happening in this human machine. Becoming aware of how things are coming into you and how things are emerging inside of you. You see, this human machine, as I said, only transforms energy. There are a lot of energies coming into us through our senses, right? Physically, through our eyes, through our ears. Everything that we see, everything we hear, everything we feel. All of that energy is coming in through the personality and into the three brains. Moreover, there's a lot surging inside of us also. We need to be aware of this. In the book Revolutionary Psychology, Samuel and Vior called this states and events. We need to learn to see the difference. Events are the external circumstances. States is our state of consciousness. Simple. The concept is simple. To become cognizant of it is another thing. So we learn through steady effort, continual application of force into our consciousness to, mean, to remain present and watchful. We learn to start to see how energies are coming into us from outside and how they're surging up from inside and how all those energies are transforming in our three brains. It sounds a little complicated. And in the beginning, it takes a lot of energy and it feels exhausting. Keep going. 
it takes a lot of force to awaken psyche. A lot. This is why all the myths present this teaching in the form of stories that show the warrior who has to fight against the dragon, who has to go into the underworld, who has to face many ordeals and challenges in order to save the princess, the maiden. Remember when um, Heracles and the other Greek heroes descend into the abyss to perform their duty, they face Cerberus. Remember him? He's a three-headed dog. That three-headed dog is your three brains, but under control of animal instinct. We have to control that beast. Heracles took control of that beast and made it his guide. And that is our duty. That is what the Oracle of Delphi does, sitting on the three-legged tripod in perfect equanimity, perfect serenity, in command, in balance with the three brains. This means a profound sense of balance psychologically. This is not something that you can arrive to today or overnight. You remember how hard it was to learn to ride a bicycle? You would fall, you would get hurt, you would cry. And what did you say? Daddy, help me. Mommy, help me. You have to do the same thing now. But daddy and mommy are your internal parents. And you have to pray continually. Please help me learn to ride my bicycle. The bicycle is your psyche. You may have even had dreams like this. Guidance. Seeing yourself riding a bicycle it relates to this. It relates to learning to balance on your human machine, the machine of the bicycle. That balance takes practice. It takes effort. It takes continuity. It doesn't come easily. It doesn't come overnight. It takes patience and a continual effort. But with that continual effort, gradually what you arrive to is an ability to maintain mindfulness, consistent awareness of what you're doing to be continually observant of oneself. This balance is very important. It is what the Buddha taught, the middle path. It is neither repression or indulgence. This is very important psychological fact. We tend to do the pendulum psychologically. That's one of the keys of the conditioned consciousness, is that it is a great pendulum that's always swinging back and forth between like and dislike, between pleasure and pain. And you see that in all three brains. All three brains have this fundamental duality. You see, if I tell you one concept that strikes you as wrong, your mind will immediately go all the way to the extreme. So an example would be, I don't know, I can't think of a good example. But our mind tends to go to these big extremes from one side to the other. We never have the ability to be in the middle. So we may say, somebody once said actually this. If I remember myself, if I'm observing myself, I can't do my job, and so I'm going to get fired. And then I'm going to starve. That's an example of how the mind takes everything to extremes. The person has got so much fear that they can't realize that self-observation will actually help them do a better job. It will help them be more successful because they'll be able to do their actions with awareness and do them accurately and not make mistakes. So self-observation, self-remembering will make you a better person. Not worse. But they didn't understand that. So this pendulum of like, dislike, pleasure, and pain is in the intellect, it's in the emotion, and it's in impulses, it's in action. The psychological equilibrium is to learn to be in the middle of all of that. So when we have thoughts that emerge, we have emotions that surge up, we have impulses that surge, we don't immediately react. 
with self-observation and self-remembering, you, can re you remain in control. Normally, for example, being asleep, if somebody comes and says something rude or harsh to us, we immediately react inside. Maybe not physically, but immediately in our heart we feel pain, we feel anger, and we want to react with a response of violence. It could be a critical word. We could curse at them. We might make a gesture. We might even attack them physically. We might repress all of that and just react in the mind. But nonetheless, that reaction happens. But when you're observing yourself really, and really in conscious control of your three brains, that doesn't happen in the same way. We don't automatically react. We might see those words come in to our senses. We might see our heart feel that pain. But when we observe and we're conscious of ourselves, we can transform that and not react mechanically. And this is how we can start to grasp the profound behaviors of great masters, such as Jesus, being on the cross, being crucified, being tortured, who only responds with love and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We wouldn't do that. We'd be up there saying, Father, send lightning and hailstorms and open the earth and take them to hell. You know, we'd have this big reaction because of pride, because of self-love, because of anger, because of resentment. And envy, we'd say, I want to be on that cross over there. Nobody's bothering him. <laughs> right? Be honest. This is how we are. Conscious control of the three brains puts us in a position to be able to transform impressions. So we see two levels here. First is to establish a continual awareness of oneself. It's not easy. Don't expect you'll get it in a week. Dedicate your life to it. It will pay off. Gradually, as that effort begins to bear fruit, and you begin to be more in conscious awareness of what's surging in your three brains, then impressions hit you, and you're able to take it in the same way that a goalie catches a ball in a sport. Because you're right there watching. And then when that critical word comes, you realize, I don't need to react to that guy. He has a lot of anger. He has a lot of resentment. He's suffering. He's saying those things because he's in pain like an animal or a child who's in pain and sick and is lashing out. He doesn't know what he's doing. Why should I respond with violence or anger to him, which would make it worse for both of us? I should treat him with love, with patience, with respect. It isn't that you will think those things. This will just happen. It just will happen because that's the magic of the consciousness. What this means is that previously when we were asleep, the three brains would transform these energies according to the conditioning, according to how the personality interprets events, and according to how those energies are directed into the consciousness. If in us, our anger, our pride, our envy are running the show, then all those impressions will go into our anger and our pride and our envy, and we will react in an angry, proud, and envious way. And thus, we will create more suffering. It's self-evident. On the other hand, if we're in conscious control of our human machine, the personality is passive. We no longer interpret events according to our name, our culture, our history, our ethics, our morals. We take them in without interpretation. As they are, without filtering them. That information flows through the three brains and is received by the awakened consciousness, whose state is love, serenity, patience, happiness. Then those impressions are transformed by the free consciousness. And we see the truth for what it is. We see ourselves for what we are, and we see others for what they are. We don't respond mechanically. 
We respond consciously. Isn't this what we all want? Wouldn't it be better if we could respond to all the challenges of life with selfless love, with sincere humility, with a conscious diligence? Can you imagine what the world would be like if we acted that way instead of automatically out of anger and pride and envy and fear? The world would not be the hell that it is. Right? It's obvious. But let's not wait for other people to do this transformation. We can't change anyone else. We can barely change ourselves. How can we expect to change others? Don't expect your friends, other Gnostic students, your spouse, your kids, your co-workers to do this for you. In other words, they're not going to come to you and make everything pretty and nice for you. They're not going to do what you want. The world will not change to suit your taste. The world is as it is. In other words, instead of always spending our time trying to modify our exterior circumstances, let's change what we can change, which is our attitude. Instead of having a mechanical, sleeping attitude, let's have a conscious, awakened one. And then, instead of automatically reacting to all the circumstances of our external life, we react to them consciously. We transform them. So when things are difficult in life, we're not surprised. And we respond with patience. When somebody comes to us with hate, with lust, with cruelty, we can respond with the appropriate conscious value rather than more violence. It may sound like a lofty goal, and it is, but there's no other option. There's no other alternative. If we continue as we are with our machine under the control of our subconsciousness, unconsciousness, and infraconsciousness, that conditioned consciousness will only grow. Life won't get better. It will get worse. On the other hand, if we learn to activate and use consciousness that is free of conditioning, then life can become better. This is how the oracle gave its message. Man, know thyself. And you will know the universe and its gods. In this manner, we can learn to sit in equilibrium in our human machine and begin to receive that inspiration and begin to receive the prophecy and the guidance that we need in order to manage our affairs properly. Haven't you ever wondered how it is that a single person has been able to transform the world so dramatically? Like Moses, or Jesus, or Krishna, or even the Oracle of Delphi? It wasn't that those people were somehow different from us or somehow better from us, better than us. It's that they knew how to listen to the guidance of God and act on it. That's the only difference. And all of them say the same thing. I am just a vessel. Samael and Vior stated very clearly, the Bodhisattva does not praise himself, but only acts on the guidance of God. That is our true purpose. It is not to elevate ourselves above other people, to show ourselves off. It is to do the will of our innermost, to humble ourselves before that light and transmit that light. Every one of us has that light inside. But our darkness does not comprehend it. That light that's inside is the consciousness of the superior worlds related to our own inner logos. If we want that light to emerge, it can do it, but it has to work through our three brains. 
In other words, instead of the conditioned consciousness trapped in anger and envy and pride and fear, instead of that controlling our three brains, then those divine forces can work through our three brains. And this is why there are ancient prayers that relate to praying to God to strengthen our three brains. It's to give us the strength to receive that force and transmit it without the interference of our ego, of our I. Do you have any questions? Everybody's sleeping. I was saying to awaken, wake up. There's a, uh, just an observation on the picture of the Oracle of Delphi. Um, with her sitting on the, on the uh, three legs of the, of the stool, you can tell that if at any time she falls asleep or out of balance while on her stool, she's going to go right into the picture. Absolutely. Right. Well, that's the artist's rendition, right? Um, yeah, the point is valid that if she falls asleep, she'll fall off the chair. That's what happens to us. And that's why our psyche is sleeping, lying on the floor, and using our chair is all our egos. We need to change that. You see, there's a, a lot of techniques in this tradition, a lot of tools but we need to organize them properly. And they are organized based on this comprehension. It's the understanding of our psychology that organizes the entire hundreds and thousands of techniques that we practice in this tradition. If you don't grasp that, you won't get it. There are some people who think that that Gnosis is all about fighting against exterior forces black magicians, conspiracies in the government, people in other countries, people in other movements. This is all wrong. The reason that we have all of these techniques, prayers, mantras, practices, is to work within ourselves. To become good people. Once and for all. Not to blame others, but to do our part. And that means we have to awaken. You see, we think we're asleep. And that's the issue. We think already that we are in control of ourselves. But the evidence proves that we are not. We have to see that evidence for ourselves. To do that, though, requires you awaken. It's a bit of a catch-22, they might say. The chicken and the egg. You can't awaken unless you awaken. The bottom line is, Samuel and Vior stated this very clearly, and make no mistake about it. The person who begins to clearly see that they are asleep is the one who's beginning to awaken. If you don't see yet that you're asleep, then you're dreaming. Any other questions? Two questions, but um, you talk about emptiness, you know, when you feel empty and, and, and you don't, you can't understand what's really going on, you know, inside you, you just feel empty, like, like nothing fulfills you. Um, you talk about that, why did you feel, or, I mean, why would it feel that way? Because that's, that's one, one question. Okay. The other question is, you talk about meditating on emptiness. Mm -hmm. Is that related? No. Or, okay. It's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, when we use the term emptiness, we have to define what we're talking about. In the context of that, that uh, empty space that we feel in our heart, that is a space that should be filled by our innermost, by our divine source, our divine root. When we have God within, we have contentment. 
the contentment that we seek, the security that we seek, that we're always trying to find in our external circumstances, is never true. It will never exist. Nothing external can give us security, ever. And Samael stated this very clearly. He said, people who are always seeking externally to find security do so because internally they are impoverished. And we're like that. We're all outside seeking money, trying to say, okay, we actually had a guy say, when I can have a certain amount of money in the bank, then I'll practice Gnosis. It's not the first time I've heard it. I've heard it many times. Even Master Samael heard this from students. And there was one man who was on his deathbed who said, I sincerely regret saying it. The guy was dying and then realized. And then he died. It was too late. We're like that, trying to find security in all kinds of external circumstances. For some of us, it's to be married. For some of us, it's to stop being married. <laughs> right? It's always something that we don't have, that we want, and we think, if I get that thing, then I'll be ready to awaken. It's money, it's a job, it's living in a different place, it's a house. We always have excuses trying to fill that empty spot in the heart. But that empty spot is there because we haven't let God into it. And part of the reason for that is because we've not saved any energy. We've wasted so much energy and so much life and time on illusions. A key to that, that I didn't address much in this lecture, is transmutation. You can do everything I described in this lecture perfectly, but if you don't transmute your sexual energy, you will get nowhere. Nowhere. That energy, that force, related with hormones, that word comes from also an ancient root that means the force of being. Hormone. And we all know that hormones have an incredible influence on us psychologically. If we're wasting our sexual energy and feeding our lust and using our sexual energy to avoid our fears or to build our pride, we're not going anywhere. And that emptiness will only grow. When we start to harness that energy and use it in the right way, in the divine way, and use it in a spiritual way, humbling ourselves before God, that energy is what empowers this whole process. That energy is what allows us to enter into real meditation. It is that energy that awakens psyche. And this is partly how we can explain. There are many traditions that have a lot of these, these uh, concepts and tools that we've been teaching. There are many traditions that you can study that talk about the three brains or that talk about the different aspects of our psychology, and they have all have valid knowledge, but yet we don't see the students truly awakening. They remain as they are, fighting, caught in politics, caught in violence, because of lust, because of fornication. They're missing that key. Transmutation, combined with the psychological work, is what heals that emptiness in the heart. It has to be both. That's why we talk about two trees in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life is related with psychology. The Kabbalah, the tree of life, is a map of our psychology. The tree of knowledge is Da'at, Tantra, transmutation, alchemy. We have to work with both trees. That is what cures and solves that emptiness in us. Nothing outside will do it. Only God can through this type of work. But don't confuse that emptiness with the fundamental emptiness. Shunyata, or the absolute. That is... The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Help Gnostic Radio to help others. Make a donation by visiting GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, 
We invite you to explore the wide variety of resources available on our websites. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.